Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Heroes, show where we code a complete game live on stream. We uh, did a bunch of work last weekend. <clears throat> well, I guess last Saturday, Sunday. I don't know if we did any work on Saturday for it, but we did a bunch of work last Sunday uh, to enable multi-sample anti-aliasing, which was made a little bit artificially more difficult than it possibly had to be because it looks like maybe there's some problem with the OpenGL drivers uh, on this machine that don't let us set sRGB rendering uh, for a multi-sample render target, even though you are supposed to be able to set multi-sample uh, anti-aliasing and sRGB on on the same render target, even on AMD hardware, supposedly. Uh, so we're not really sure what's up with that, uh, but this is a very old machine, so maybe that's part of the problem. But at the very least, what I can tell you is that this is pretty much why PC development is always so much of a pain in the butt, it's because the hardware is so variable and the drivers are so unreliable that you typically end up in situations where uh, you can't just count on stuff that's documented to work to actually work. That's not typically the way things go, and it's uh, a bit of a bummer. One of the reasons that people like console development, in fact, is just because uh, the platform uh, does a better job of actually saying what it can do and doing it when it uh, is asked. That said, uh, we still have to deal with the PC, obviously, and uh, it's a good platform for everything else. It's certainly a nicer platform to deal with because it's open, uh, at least as long as Microsoft continues to let it be. And uh, so, you know, it's one of those things that you got to take the, the good and the bad together in some sense uh, and, uh, and just deal with the fact that the driver situation and uh, dealing with uh, graphics, uh, GPU access on these platforms is really unsatisfying. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and go to uh, the code here. Today is day 368, and uh, so if you want to follow along at home, day 367 is the code to start with. Uh, we have on handmade uh, OpenGL here, uh, we have already done, actually I gotta open that project file as well, so we have all our code loaded and we can build, there we go. Um, we have running now something that in theory creates the render targets and also uh, renders to the render targets. Uh, but as you can see by this black screen, uh, we never see any graphics. The reason for that is we have not actually put in uh, any calls to actually get the, the buffers that we render out to the screen. So if you recall how this loop uh, is working in the OpenGL renderer, what happens is at the beginning, it goes through, uh, and it allocates render buffers for, uh, well, it allocates textures uh, for all of the frame buffers we think we might need. Now, in our case, currently, because there aren't any rooms stacked on top of each other or anything like that, uh, and we don't really have any other reason for it at the moment, we don't have more than one. So we're only going to, uh, presumably, in any given frame, uh, when, when we're looking at the contents of the command list, we're only going to see this max render target index being equal to one. And so the first time through, we're going to create one of these buffers, and that's all we're going to ever use. Now, what we can see here uh, is that we've changed this from what it used to be to calling GL text image 2D is what it used to call. We're now calling GL text image 2D multi sample. Uh, and you can see here we've had to pass GL RGB A8 instead of the uh, potentially sRGB version. And the reason for that is, again, because um, this card, for whatever reason, does not seem to be allowing us to actually pass um, sRGB. Now, one thing that I do want to address real quickly, uh, just before we get uh, any further into it, is if we go to the GitHub, uh, Martins has helpfully posted for us um, a, uh, a really great uh, bug report where he found something uh, that we were trying to find I was looking for it in the documentation, and we couldn't find it uh, the other uh, just last week when we were doing this. Uh, and he found it for us. If I go here to the handmade CPP project, and I go to the issues issues list, uh, it's it's right in here. You can see uh, where we've got this this stuff here. Uh, oops. Uh, and you can see him talking about GL max samples minus one. Uh, and he said that wiki where we looked it up was wrong. Uh, and he looked it up in the spec, which we had been trying to find and failed to find. 
Uh, and so what it says here is the real max allowed sample value for textures can be retrieved by querying GL max color text samples. GL max samples value is meant for a render buffer object from our frame buffer extension. That's what he put in there. Now, I'm not 100% sure about this. The only reason that I'm not sure about this is I don't think that that, I feel like that's the actual number of samplers you can read from um, in a texture, right? Uh, meaning, uh, not in a texture, in a, so in a texture, in a pixel shader, basically, in a fragment shader, which we haven't written yet, I'm pretty sure GL max color texture samples is how many samples you can take of textures in a shader. So if you want to take, you know, 32 samples from, you know, textures uh, in a shader, that this would say uh, whether you could do that or not. You know, whether if this number is high enough, then you can, and if it's too low, then you can't. Right, and I'm pretty sure that's that's what that does. So I don't think that's actually the correct one. Furthermore, arg um, arb texture uh, multi sample is uh, again I'm just not sure about it because that's specifically talking about grabbing it from a texture. Now I guess that's what I was thinking, but Martin's is almost always right. Uh, so that's the <laughs> so I guess that's what I would say. Um, so what I assume then is happening here is maybe what we're talking about is that GL max color texture samples um, is actually talking about how many, if you're creating a texture, how many samples the texture could have. Um, like, meaning if, a, if you're creating a render buffer object, there's a certain number of multi-sampling, certain multi-sampling level you can do there. And if you're creating a texture object, there's a different level of multi-sampling you can do there, right? Um, I don't know. So uh, again, because of the fact that Martin's is almost always right, that makes me believe that we should probably uh, take a look at, at these here at the very least, just so we can see what's going on and try to figure out what the actual uh, rationale is there exactly. Uh, maybe take a look at that. Um, uh, maybe take a look at that extension as well, because the extension is usually where things are explained uh, in the best way. Uh, so if I go ahead and open up the the uh, core arb header, uh, I'm going to grab that max color texture samples. Uh, and if I go up here and just paste that in, we should now be able to um, get that value. Oops, I got to set a breakpoint though. So they're both equal to eight in this case, uh, which makes me think that Martin's is in fact right, uh, because the number of color sa samples you could take in the shader uh, would definitely be more than that, I would think. Uh, so I think Martin's is, is definitely correct on this, uh, and we should change it. Um, like I said, Martin's is, is uh, pretty much spot on. So when he sends something in, uh, you'd, you'd better pay attention. That's been my uh, experience anyway. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. Oops, I don't need to get rid of that. Um, let's get rid of this. Uh, and use that value. Now this is not going to help us, unfortunately. It's because they were both set to the same value. That that's obviously has nothing to do, and we tested a bunch of values anyway. That has nothing to do with the problem that we really have here of these uh, surfaces not having the correct um, draw format. They should be sRGB, and they're not. So that's a bit of an issue, but what are you going to do? Uh, anyway, what we need to do now to finish this up uh, is at some point, remember these are all rendering to textures now, at some point at the end, we need to actually target the real frame buffer. Uh, and we need to target that frame buffer because the only way we can actually present something to the, the, the actual user in OpenGL is to at some point draw into frame buffer zero. Frame buffer zero is the one that's the actual backing store for the window that will actually get displayed when we call swap buffers. Um, and so in order to, to have our stuff displayed through swap buffers, we have to make sure that we draw to it eventually. Now, 
when we want to draw to it, you can see here um, I've saved the GL viewport call, uh, which will set up the same viewport to the main uh, buffer that we had wanted before. And that's, again, in case uh, the resolution we get needs to be letterboxed uh, for our game or anything else like that. Uh, and then we've got a GL blit frame buffer call here. That's the last thing we need to do. Uh, GL blit flame buffer is, is I guess, uh, not quite what we... Um, it's a little misleading, I guess, is what I would say. The reason that we have to call GL blit frame buffer, even though we're talking about taking a texture and putting it to the screen, is because as far as I could tell uh, from the documentation in OpenGL, the way to do a multi-sample resolve is to call GL blit frame buffer even if it's in a texture. So you bind your multi-sample texture to a frame buffer. You do the blit frame buffer from that synthetic frame buffer to uh, frame buffer zero, and that does the resolve. Now, what do I mean when I say resolve? Well, resolve is just the term that I don't know why it's the term that's used for it. It's the term that, that they came up with when they were first talking about this, where if you have a buffer that's a multi-sample buffer like I described last weekend, if you want to take that set of multi-samples and produce actual colors from them, you have to like average them together or do some kind of a filter on them to produce final pixel values that you can show on the screen. Because remember, multi-sample means more than one sample per pixel in our case. We can't display more than one sample per pixel. The monitor has to display a pixel in each pixel. It's pixel to pixel, right? Uh, it doesn't have the option of showing more than one color sample in a given pixel. So we have to smush those color samples down to produce a single output color sample for every pixel, and we need the graphics card to do that. We can't write a for i loop to do it, right? Because we're on the CPU here. So we have to tell the graphics card to do it um, either by uploading it some code or calling something that it already knows how to do. In this case, it already does know how to do it. So we need to sort of tell it to do that thing. <clears throat> GL blit frame buffer looks like the way to do it. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at docs.gl and see what that GL blit flame buffer uh, call looks like. Here is the earliest version of it. Uh, you can see it here. It's got uh, sort of a, uh, a source, uh, a uh, <clears throat> source rectangle and a desk rectangle, which is something we're obviously very familiar with. Here we go. Um, uh, let's put this up in here. There we are. And uh, these rectangles, as far as I know, um, if they're in integer coordinates, that would suggest that this is bypassing the viewport, potentially, which might mean that this is not a relevant call. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, it'll say in the spec. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to look it up somewhere. <clears throat> so let's take a look. Uh, otherwise, we've got sort of a mask. We only need to uh, use the GL color buffer bit in this case. We don't need the depth buffer or the stencil buffer to copy because we've already done any work we were going to do with those. Um, we will have done them in the, in the renderer proper up above this call. Uh, so we just need the, the color buffer bit. And then finally, the filter specifies the interpolation uh, if the image is stretched. In this case, I assume we want uh, nearest. Right, because we do want it to sort of do some averaging here. I'm sorry, uh, linear, rather, because we do want to do some averaging here. Now, what I don't know um, is what exactly happens here with uh, with multi-sample. So I'm going to just double check to see if we can uh, uh, if we can get a little bit more information about that here. Uh, there we go. This is, of course, the unreliable wiki, but uh, here it is. Uh, so you can see here, right here, is where they do the resolve. Uh, and so I'm assuming uh, that that is, yeah, that that's, that's what we want there. Uh, And it doesn't really say anything other than doing this split will automatically resolve the FBO. Uh, so it looks like that's pretty much all we would need to do since we don't need to microprogram it at the moment. Uh, so in theory, if we're right, that will just work. So that's fine. 
right? Um, now what we need to do here, obviously, is we need to make sure that we can actually bind uh, both frame buffers. Uh, and you can see in here where we've done this bind before. Um, let's take a look here uh, up in my frame buffer. Uh, you can see here we've got uh, global frame buffer handles, uh, target index. What we want to do is bind that zeroth frame buffer. Um, and we, I suppose we also want to make sure that we actually have any frame buffers at all if nobody did anything. If max render target index uh, is, is zero, I suppose, uh, then we wouldn't want to do anything. Here we go. And uh, so when we go ahead and bind the frame buffer, we're going to have to bind uh, these two uh, frame buffers here. We need the global frame buffer handle zero. That's the one we want to read from. This is the one we want to write to. Uh, and so when we actually go ahead and do that, you can see we need to specify each one into a slot that glblit frame buffer uh, will understand. Right? So we want the GL draw frame buffer uh, to be frame buffer zero, and we want the read frame buffer to be our global frame buffer handle. So we want to read from this one, and we want to draw to this one. Right? That's our goal here. Uh, so then we come through here, and we do our GL viewport. Uh, we set up the viewport, and then we do the blit. Uh, and all I really need to know now is what coordinates these are in. Now for the source, it should be fairly straightforward because it's just going to be uh, 0, 0. We know that these um, are entirely uh, always created exactly the same size. So we know, uh, you can see here, um, where's our, uh, not there, here we go. Uh, you can see when we create them here, we always do uh, them the same get width, get height of the draw region, right? So we know that that's going to be that that's going to look like this for the source, no matter what, uh, because the source never has a shrunk viewport to it. It never has anything uh, weird going on at the moment. If it does later, we'll have to change that. Um, but then we've got this destination one here, and the question is just: Does the destination one follow this? Uh, is it you know is it the draw region style uh, stuff here that we need to do, uh, or? Uh, is, it, is it relative to the viewport, in which case it, we should pass the exact same things to it? Uh, and that's all I really need to know. So let's see. Uh, let's see. The extra draw buffer is there's extra reach me. The scaling and offset. Uh, the lower bounds of the rectangle are inclusive. The upper are exclusive. Uh, so it's not really telling me here, I'm afraid. Um, so I guess I don't know what to do about that exactly. Because uh, I need this to specify. What it wants those coordinates in. Uh, maybe. Uh, if I'm lucky. Uh, it will specify. So let's take a look. Here is the original one from NVIDIA, it looks like. And let's see. Transfers a rectangle pixel values from one region of the read frame buffer to another region of the draw buffer, bitwise or describes the pixels corresponding to these buffers are copied from the source rectangle bound by the locations to the bound the lower bounds are inclusive. So it's transferred, values taken for the read, the actual region. This is the exact same text. So I guess I'm just gonna assume that the viewport is not in there, but I really just don't know. It's not being straightforward about whether or not uh, it would be in, in window coordinates or view coordinates or what. Um, so I don't know. So I'm going to assume uh, that it's this. And uh, it looks like these are not uh, these are not in width height terms, width, width, width and height terms. 
Uh, so what I really want here is, you know, when I'm doing this, the draw region uh, max x and the draw region max y are actually what we're looking for here. Uh, and then finally, it looks like we've got to get all of these together uh, from the OpenGL core arb list and uh, query them, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, get that core arb header. And we need those two. There we go. And uh, we need there we go. So we now need to put these into Wiggle uh, our calls to get the stuff from Wiggle. You can see here that we've got the other frame buffer calls. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and stick it on there. Oops, I was missing the back half. There we go. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and make this GL blit frame buffer. There's the call, the call signature. Um, we need a type def for it. There we go. Uh, and then we just need the global variable. So in order to get this now, we have to go uh, actually ask for it, right? And at this point, we pretty much need all these. So what we really can change this into at some point is just something um, that actually just requires this and won't start the game without it, because pretty much uh, there's not going to be a way to run OpenGL on this without multi-sample since we've decided that that's basically a requirement. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to use cards from more than a decade ago, uh, you can't with Handmade Hero uh, unless someone wants to write a, a different renderer backend, which they could, uh, but we're not going to support that natively. So at that point, it looks like we're pretty good to go. Uh, we compile all right uh, now whether or not anything works or not we don't know oops uh, so we got to kind of go over here and take a look uh, make sure we're actually calling this what's going on here oh uh, wait a minute max frame buffer texture uh, the uh, that was kind of dumb we always have uh, zero is actually a valid one and so that's actually not necessary at all. That's going to prevent that code from ever getting called, which is not what we want. Uh, so actually, this is just always OK, because there always is a 0 with 1 in every case. Uh, and we actually want the 0 with 1. All right. Um, oh my. Well, uh, it looks like that worked better than I thought it was going to work. Um, and uh, presumably, we now just need to create some depth buffers to attach to our textures. Uh, that's uh, that's great. I was not expecting that to just work. But it looks like it just did. All right, so now what we have to do is re-enable our Z-buffer. I mean, our Z-buffer is enabled, but it, it doesn't actually do anything. Why doesn't it do anything? Well, it doesn't do anything because we have no actual um, uh, depth buffer attached. So this is the thing, again, uh, you have to remember what we're doing here when we create these uh, textures, right? We're creating textures that we're going to render into. And those uh, textures have to act just like a frame buffer would. When the graphics card, or I should say when Wiggle automatically sets up um, a back buffer for us when we ask to open the open shell window, it's going to have the stuff we asked for. So it's going to have a depth buffer, it's going to have a stencil buffer, it's going to have a color buffer, whatever, right? All those things will actually be there. We, if we want to use those buffers ourselves, we need to set them up ourselves when we render to a texture. So we set up a color buffer. That's what we're doing with this call. Uh, but we have not created a depth buffer. 
So we do need to create a depth buffer and attach it. Uh, so you can see that happening here. You can see that we've got this frame buffer texture 2D call, and you can see that it goes, okay, GL frame buffer, GL color attachment, zero. What we need to do is create a depth attachment, which is to create a texture that will hold the Z buffer, right, the depth buffer, to go along with our color buffer. So right now, our Z buffer is essentially disabled because when we set the render target to be targeting our texture, it no longer has a depth buffer attached, so depth is not used. Um, so again, slot in this case, uh, we will need to sort of um, redo this same logic up here uh, effectively. So we'll need to, to bind, you know, we'll need to do a, uh, a thing like this here, I guess, um, in order to do that. <coughs> uh, because it, I believe it has to be bound. Um, wait a minute. So I guess it doesn't have to be bound. So we don't need to do that, I guess. I guess we can just say uh, depth texture handle here, right, and be done with it. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what this uh, last parameter here is. Let me just double check what it is. Uh, so that is GL. Ah, it's the level. Uh, so that's just the mipmap level we're drawing to, which in this case, again, is zero. We are not using mipmaps uh, in the rendering here at all. So that all looks reasonable, uh, as far as I can tell. So all we need to do is create one of these depth texture handles. So uh, what I might do is say, uh, let's create a GL text handle uh, glue in here. Let's just do text handle two. And then we'll just say, let's gen give us two uh, of these text handles. Then we'll bind the first one. This doesn't need to be here. Uh, we'll bind the first one. Uh, we will create what we wanted to create here with it. Uh, and then we'll bind the second one. Uh, and the second one, we just have to, again, do creation of a depth buffer that has um, the same layout, basically, as our color buffer that can you know, match up with it, right? Uh, so pretty much this should all be the same, except we need to pass a different value for what it's actually storing. OK, so here's that function. And everything else should basically be the same. Uh, but again, this internal format here needs to be something different. So the internal format uh, is going to be, and unfortunately, this doesn't list them, it looks like. Uh, so probably we'll just have to go to GL text image 2D and get them. Or I don't know where it might list them in here. Uh, Let's see. No. So can I search for GL RGB A8? No. Well, I believe that we can just use, because uh, I happen to know. Uh, that there is a depth format. We just need to find out what its identifier was. Uh, I just need you to tell me the d identifier for the depth. Uh, let's see here. OpenGL internal texture format list. So this is sort of what we're looking for, but not quite. Here we go. Depth component 16, 24, 32, and 32F. So <clears throat> at this point, we kind of have uh, 
a decision to make. What kind of depth buffering we want to do? Do we want a 32-bit depth buffer? Do we want a 16-bit depth buffer? Um, obviously, a 16-bit depth buffer and a 32-bit depth buffer differ in that a 32-bit depth buffer has more precision, right? Uh, and so if we use a 32-bit depth buffer, we will have less z-fighting in cases where we might have z-fighting, which might be nice. On the other hand, it would be twice as large. Twice as large means half as fast, usually, uh, because it means that the graphics card has to use more memory bandwidth fetching the depth components, and if they are twice as big, then it will be twice as slow doing that, right? It just takes more memory. Now, if you're not memory bound, uh, that won't make a difference, but if you are, maybe it does. I don't know which of the two to pick up front. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to switch between. Um, so I guess let's start with the easier one, which is 32F, uh, because that's a better one. <clears throat> uh, it's going to be the highest quality one and the easiest to use. And then we'll regress down uh, to depth component 16 if we find that it, it's a speed win to do so uh, at some point for us that we care about. So let's try that, and let's take a to-do in there that says to-do, uh, check if going with a 16-bit depth buffer would be uh, faster. <clears throat> because our game doesn't have long draw distances, uh, so we can, uh, you know, it should, we don't have long draw distances, right? We should be able to, I would think, get what we need out of a 16-bit depth buffer. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. So, uh, if we create one of these multi-sample uh, doodads here <clears throat> for the depth buffer, then uh, we can bind both our texture handles here, one and two, uh, to get both the color and the depth set up for this frame buffer, at which point we should be able to render into it with the Z buffer again. Uh, I believe that's all we would really have to do. Um, let's take a look here. Uh, that should be no address of. Um, texture handles. Global frame buffer textures. That wants to be text handle zero. Not that it matters. Uh, and so we really just need the depth attachment and depth component from core arb. Those are those depth components right there. Uh, and then we need geo depth attachment. Uh, and that should be everything. Now, uh, because we're switching to using our own textures for rendering here exclusively, uh, and uh, that's looking pretty good, right? That's exactly what we wanted to see. Uh, now we've got a depth buffer, uh, and we've got multi-sample anti-aliasing there. Um, and uh, you can also see that a number of other things are working properly now. You can notice we get in, we've, uh, that alpha to coverage has solved the problem that I was suggesting it would solve. Uh, which is to say that it is uh, correctly kind of doing this uh, this edging. We're no, long, we're no longer getting those edge artifacts. Uh, we still do have the problem of things laying, laying down too flat, uh, which we need to solve, like I said, by potentially just uh, mussing with it in the shader, as opposed to doing it geometry-wise, which I think might just be more um, computation work than it's worth. <clears throat> But otherwise, we have the render working exactly like we want it to, except, uh, well, except for two, two things. So one is we, we're, our colors are wrong, right? Because we, since we couldn't specify sRGB like we wanted to, remember this uh, problem over here? So um, <clears throat> we jump down there. Uh, so remember this, this problem. Right, OpenGL default internal texture format. Uh, remember that. 
uh, needs to be on. And at the moment, we can't seem to get that to work, right? Uh, we get a GL error. Um, Is there a GL set error? How do I clear it? I just want to confirm that nothing renders because I'm assuming that that error also means that nothing renders. If I get it, will it automatically clear it? So I guess all I really need to do here is step over these. So there's set next statement, set next statement. Yeah, so you can just see This is interesting. New frame buffer count equals commands max render. This is busted. So new frame buffer count equals commands max render texture te max render target is plus one, and we are going up to and including that one, which is not correct. In fact, I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why we're doing it that way at all. The new count. Yeah, this is just this is just nonsense. So we're creating one more render buffer than we need because that loop is is incorrect, right? This should just say that. And furthermore, we could just do it like this. And then it's just using the direct value directly, which seems better to me. All right, let's try that one more time. Again, I'm going to skip over these assertions here. And I just want to confirm that we don't render, uh, because we shouldn't. Uh, but I want to make sure. Yeah. So as far as we know, on this card, we are not able uh, to set sRGB rendering on a texture. It just doesn't work. Uh, so we're going to need to figure out what to do about that, not the least of which because I don't think that's true of pretty much any graphics card in existence at, uh, today that anyone's still using. Uh, you should pretty much always be able to do that, as far as I know. Uh, so it's really kind of strange that, that we can't. Um, you know, eight, eight times over uh, sampled multi-sample anti-aliasing, and uh, and you know render targets and all this stuff and sRGB is is not supported is weird, uh, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. But uh, we can do a little bit more cleanup here, um, even though we're, we're getting most of the way through uh, the render setup stuff we need to do. I am so stuffy. It's allergy season here, at least as far as I know. I'm just constantly blowing my nose. It's disgusting. Anyway, uh, so what we need to do now is we need to actually uh, clean up some stuff from the Win32 side that, that we didn't really actually need. Um, so if you take a look at how this is working here, uh, where we've got the depth bits arb stuff uh, happening, uh, the depth bits arb stuff doesn't actually need to happen anymore. The red, green, blue, alpha depth bits stuff uh, just doesn't really need to be there. Uh, we used to be using it, but we don't really need it. Uh, the reason that we don't need it is because now um, the depth bits is not used. The frame buffer's depth bits are not used. We are only using a depth buffer from our actual uh, 
from the textures that we create, that's the only time we're using them. Uh, so we're drawing exclusively to textures. Those textures have Z buffers. Uh, you know, we, we create Z buffer textures for the frame buffers that we're using that are our texture frame buffers. Uh, so we don't actually need to have the frame buffer itself have that depth bits. So this is just a waste now, uh, and we can go ahead and get rid of it. So I believe we can actually go back to the way we had this originally now, uh, where we just sort of do this. Um, and now we've got uh, this is just five again. In addition to that, uh, the other thing that I think we should be able to do is sRGB capable frame buffers should now not be necessary either. Uh, because since we're not drawing directly to the frame buffer, I think we could probably delete this code too. Um, right, this is probably not necessary, if that makes sense. Uh, because if you think about what's happening, the sRGB rendering is, can all happen in the texture. Once we have the textures completely done, um, we in theory wouldn't need to do that anymore. Now, I'm going to leave it in there, because it may be that the multi-sample resolve is still best done in linear space, and maybe this will force that to be true. I don't know. Um, so I guess that might be premature, and we'll just leave that in there for now. Uh, but we do not need a depth buffer, um, like I said. And you can see that the depth buffering is still working just fine. The reason for that is because we're using uh, a depth buffer we made as a texture and bound. Uh, so that's all good now. Uh, no real worries here. And the only things we need to worry about now are, again, we've got to make um, a, uh, we've got to go ahead and put some <clears throat> uh, some work into loading a shader so that we can modify the Z values properly and we have to figure out how we want to do that. Uh, but then the other thing that we need to do uh, is we need to fix our alpha shading, uh, or our, our alpha uh, tinting, I guess you could say. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about that. Now, the reason we did the multi-sample was specifically so we could get the edges of sprites to work properly. Uh, and you can see they are now working properly, and that's good. Uh, we don't get any of that weird fringing anymore. Uh, we don't get the weird depth mismatch stuff anymore. So that's all good. And so in fact, the only thing we need to do really to finish our sprite rendering is to have uh, the, those tweaked Z values uh, in order to make sure that things work properly there. But uh, as you can kind of see, I don't know, it might be that the video quality is not good enough when it's streamed to really see this. I can see it on my machine. You may not be able to see it on yours, and I apologize for that. But if you ran the game at home, you'd see it. Uh, the fade levels of these sprites that used to f fade out smoothly are now fading out in, like jerk, in a jerky motion in color space. They're, they're still moving around the screen just fine, obviously. But there's this kind of stair-steppy kind of... Uh, fade out effect. And what's that coming from? Well, that's coming from the fact that we've told uh, the game now that all the alpha uh, that's being used is alpha to coverage, right? So that means that the only thing that's going to happen if we set a sprite's alpha value lower is it's going to fill less samples in the multi-sample buffer. Since the multi-sample buffer only has eight samples, that means that no matter how much range our alpha has, we will only ever see eight steps worth from full opaque to translucent. Sorry, transparent, <clears throat> fully transparent. So not good. Right? That is not what we want. We want the alpha coming from our texture to have that be the case. Uh, we don't want the alpha uh, coming as from our tint uh, for that to be the case. So that is definitely an issue, but I'm not sure if it's an issue we can address in the fixed function pipeline or not. Uh, that's a really good question, and I am not sure. I really don't know. It might be. Oh. While we're at it, we should probably check our cutscenes. Hmm. 
Hmm. <clears throat> All right, so our cutscenes have a couple problems. One, it looks like we changed the projection um, sort of blow up values a little bit in a way that we're going to have to fix. Uh, but otherwise, it looks OK uh, besides the sRGB problem, right? You can see that all the colors are too dark. Uh, and that's obviously uh, just because the sRGB rendering isn't enabled. And we don't really know how to enable it on this machine. Uh, we, we need uh, to figure out why that's happening. I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, because in theory, it should just be, uh, it should just be working when we specify that value. So again, not really sure what's going on there, but you know, what are you going to do? Uh, so we'll take a look at that a little bit later. But what I was saying before uh, is we need to take a look at what we can do uh, with those alpha values, and, uh, and, and we'll see what's going on. So what's, what's actually happening in this OpenGL pipeline now uh, with the way think we've got things? Let's just take a quick second to review, because we've done a lot of work here. Um, to, to set up our rendering, and we've got some fairly complicated stuff happening in there. So let's just recap. I mean, certainly not complicated compared to a modern full uh, 3D rendering system, which does even more ridiculous shenanigans. But in terms of Handmade Hero, where we have always done software rendering, and now we're just doing, uh, we're starting to do more hardware rendering stuff, it's probably uh, a little bit unfamiliar to a lot of people. So let's just quickly recap what's going on here. Uh, so remember, We've got a, a screen buffer, right? This is our back buffer here. Uh, we have our back buffer. And this back buffer at the moment uh, is just color. It's just RG, it's just an sRGB A 8-bit. And I'm going to put question mark here because we're not even specifying that. So who knows how many bits it is? The operating system is actually free to pick any depth it wants. So it's an sRGBA 8-bit frame buffer. That's our back buffer. Um, we never draw to this uh, directly, ever. Uh, we used to. Now we don't. Um, so we got to output stuff to this. Where does it come from? Where it comes um, from a texture that we created, right? It's an sRGB 8-bit uh, texture. That's how we created it. And it's, at the moment, 8x MSAA. Now, we, we allow in the code anything up to 16x MSAA. On this particular card, uh, it's that. So maybe what I should say is some amount MSAA. What that means is in this texture, right, if I was to take a single pixel in the same place on both of these, actually this one has one sample, and this one has, in our case, eight, right? So what that means is during the blit frame buffer call, right, GL blit frame buffer, these eight samples in this texture are getting smushed down to one sample in the output. So that's the ant that anti-aliasing step, right? So this is a frame buffer texture we're using here. Furthermore, stacked with that, these are sort of together in use, uh, is a 32-bit float depth buffer. And it also has that MSAA. Right? Now, this does never get split to a back buffer or anything. It's strictly used essentially as a temporary buffer during rendering to do depth sorting, right? It's per pixel or per sample in this case, depth sorting. Now, when we actually render, we are rendering to these buffers. So we render to these, right? Here's our render. We render to these, and only at the end does the GL blit flame buffer take the data out of the color buffer. This gets thrown away. No one cares about what it is. Um, we take whatever we render to there, and we put it to the screen, doing that 8 to 1 downsampling that produces the uh, sort of smooth anti-aliased values as a result. OK. 
So here's our render step. What is our render step doing? Well, what our render step is doing uh, is our render step is taking our sprite textures uh, and a sprite texture has a particular pixel value. It's one sample, right? Um, and uh, I guess more, more accurately, since we have bilinear filtering on, really what's happening is it's taking four samples, smushing those down to one, right? So it produces one sample by averaging these together with a certain rule, with a bilinear filter, right? We end up with one sample from our texture. So we have one sprite sample that we're left with. And then we also have a, you know, color, right? So both of these have alpha values in them. There's an alpha here and there's an alpha here. And those two alpha values, we actually want two different things uh, to happen with these two alpha values. And that's the confusing part of this, right? So what we want to have happen is alpha from this, uh, right? We would want to, well, I guess not, wait a minute. Let me not say that quite right. Let me not say that quite yet. Uh, I just realized that actually, if we want things to fade out, they would have to be drawn in uh, a fading pass anyway. Uh, so that's probably dumb that I'm even talking about this. It's good that I did this diagram because it's good to have anyway. But now I think about it, there's really no way we could deal with that in any other way for the fading outness of it. Yeah, never mind. I take it all back. Um, so. <clears throat> If we take a look at what's happening here, uh, we've got these two alpha values. They have to uh, combine together. And I was going to say we want to use one different than the other. The only way we can really use uh, a more transparent, to, to get more transparent steps there, is to draw transparent object in a separate pass um, that doesn't uh, rely on the multi-sampling. So at the moment, I don't know that we have really any other thing we can do better than that, which, uh, yeah, in this case, I, I think we just have to live with that. <clears throat> so uh, I believe that's all correct. Uh, so we've got the sprite sample. We've got the color. Um, we combine those two, and we produce the rendered uh, pixels that go and operate on our death buffer and our, our frame buffer. Now, so that's all good. I think we're all good there. Um, so I think the only thing we have left to do is really to cheat uh, those z values so that uh, the z values that we're using in the z buffer are going to be uh, exaggerated. Now, I'm not sure if we can do that without a shader or not. I have to think about it. It may be possible to do so. But I doubt it. So we'll take a look. I think that we could do certain things with it, uh, but not others. So, let's take a look. At the moment, uh, let's say here's our camera. It's looking down at the scene this way. Here's two like stair step pieces of ground. Uh, and here's a tree. For obvious reasons, we want the tree to be camera facing because we want it to show up properly, right? We want it to show up 
such that it appears to be a rectangular sprite aligned with the screen. So here's the plane that it's going to be in, right? Now, our problem is that we want it to really look more like this. And the reason that we want it to look more like that uh, is because we want it to occlude things behind it as if it were standing up kind of rather straight, right? Um, and it's always a kind of a, a bit of a, you know, a, it's definitely trickery because we don't have 3D geometry. We're making up some fanciful 3D geometry that we hope will do sort of what a sprite what a sprite's image implies it would do if it was in 3D, right? But we don't actually have full 3D geometry, which is what we would need to always produce a correct scene. So we're just guessing here, but we know that we can do something a lot better than that. So we want it to appear as if it's doing this, which means that fundamentally speaking, what we want to do uh, is adjust the Z values for the Z buffer so that the things uh, in here uh, as we go, the Z values are actually, uh, even though this is the X, Y's we're producing, the Z values are actually produced as if we were on this plane. Right? That's what we actually want to do. Uh, and so all we really need for this purpose uh, is essentially a Z bias value uh, that's associated with these uh, vertex positions as they come in. And like I said, in a shader, this would be very easy to do, which is why I would think we should do it that way rather than try to do a bunch of weird math trickery that we don't really need to do. So what I would propose is say like, okay, you know, we've got an X, Y, Z that we're passing down for each of these points. Let's just also pass down a Z bias value and the Z bias value is just something that when you're actually producing the depth component of this thing, let's actually make sure that depth component is offset uh, by whatever the v Z bias value should be, right? Uh, so we can just set that Z bias value there to be whatever we want and therefore pretend that the thing is standing up like this, even though it's not, right? And then we still get all the same rest of the stuff exactly what we want with, you know, uh, with perspective and everything sits in the scene properly, but we just need this. So we'd essentially send down four coordinates instead of three for every vertex, uh, which is no big deal. We're not going to be vertex uh, throughput bound in this uh, game, I assure you, at least not on any modern card. So that seems very nice. And then all we do is in our uh, computation of where these vertices are, we do exactly the same transform we're doing now, where we just do P prime equals you know, AP. This is that uh, a sort of composite matrix that we've been making. We do exactly this, but at the end, at this P prime after it's done, all we're saying is that that P prime's Z coordinate, right, uh, is going to have that Z bias per vertex added in. So the only difference between this and what we're doing is that we'll have a per vertex Z offset. So you could think of, you know, uh, when we've got our matrices here, right? Um, and we sort of have, if, if, you, if you look at what's in here, uh, you know, we've got our, our X axis here And here's the translation, right? This is how we were doing object placement, right? We have the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, and then the translation was in here. Uh, and the problem with this is that this is fixed. For everybody who, uh, for all the vertices that go through the system, uh, when we set one of these camera transforms up, this matrix, which we multiplied by the projection matrix to get our final matrix, uh, only has one Z offset, right? The, the, the Z offset value is only going to be applied, uh, it's going to be applied to all vertices uniformly. So I can't offset these vertices differently from these vertices. There's no way to do so, right? So all I'm saying is we just need something which 
is doing effectively the same thing, just incrementing a z value, just like the matrix is doing after the fact. We've got that. We just don't have a way to do it per vertex. And so that's all I really want. And like I said, the easiest way to do that would be with shaders. Unfortunately, that's a pretty huge step we have to take uh, because now we have to have those shaders uh, and uh, we have to um, you know, implement the shader loading code and all that sort of stuff. So I'm guessing what I should probably do, because we've got an hour left, is just show how to get that process started. And then next weekend will just be a shader weekend where we go through how they work uh, and how to write them, because that's sort of a topic that will require me to do a lot of explanation that we don't have time to do today. So uh, let's just go ahead and do some preparation work for that uh, as we go, and we'll, we'll go from there. So if I, first of all, know that I'm going to need to send down an additional coordinate uh, in addition to what I'm ex already sending down for things um, like these bitmaps uh, that are coming through, then I know that I need to upgrade in my render entry bitmap this, this p value here uh, and these x, y axes and that sort of stuff. This stuff now needs to be extended a little bit, right? And uh, you know, it depends on how we want to do it. Uh, but you know, for the for the moment, we could just use a single z bias value um, that's going to to go in there, and later we could sort of look at making that a little bit more general. Um, but you know, essentially, we only really need one for the moment. Uh, and uh, that z bias, if we went into handmade uh, OpenGL, right? Uh, you can imagine this here, where we're doing. Uh, there's our cubes. Uh, when we're doing our bitmaps, you can see here we sort of got our vertex 3 FV stuff happening. Uh, instead, what you could imagine is, all right, the lower triangle, upper triangle system that we're doing here, where we're starting with min UV uh, and min Y, here we would say that it's actually going to be a, uh, a V4 in all cases, right? Uh, and when we produce this V4, uh, we're always going to start with a v3, uh, but we're going to include the z bias or not, depending on which one it is. So in max y, we would include the z bias. Uh, but in min y's, we wouldn't. And again, that's just to, to create that exact shape that I was just talking about. right? Um, and so there's our z bias. And this just allows us to send v4s down, right? Uh, and those v4s are going to have that z bias in there. Now, the problem with this is that this will immediately cause, uh, or should cause, kind of disastrous results. Uh, and you can see why. Um, that's an uninitialized value, obviously, but that's not really the reason why it's going to be a disaster. The reason it's going to be a disaster is because right now, without the shaders, this GL vertex for V is actually setting the W coordinate uh, of the tr vectors that are going to get transformed, right? Now, we know that it's a Z bias value. We know that it's not supposed to be the W coordinate that's used in the vector transform, but OpenGL doesn't know that yet because we haven't loaded a shader that tells it how to operate on incoming vertex values. So it just sees a value that's the fourth value of the vertex that goes, oh, it's trying to tell me um, how to set the W coordinate. I should set the W coordinate and multiply that through the matrix. That's exactly not what we want to do here. So that is an expected uh, erroneous behavior that uh, won't get fixed until the shaders are um, written. So now in our push bitmap call, Uh, when we when we do push bitmap and we're setting that entry p value here, uh, we want that to be set uh, to that uh, z bias to be set here. And at the moment, we can just set it to zero zero, and then that'll be fine, right? Uh, because uh, that will restore sort of uh, you know some functionality to oh, I guess that won't, now that I think about it, the z value, the, o, the w coordinate has to be 1 uh, in these cases. So I guess there really is no way for me to restore 
this behavior now that I think about it. Um, we can restore the value, uh, behavior for two of the points, uh, right? Uh, but not the other one, uh, which kind of produces a rather amusing effect, I suppose, uh, as everybody gets sort of sucked out into infinity um, and beyond there. Uh, yeah, so I can't reproduce it, I guess, at the moment, so we'll have to actually just do something reasonable here. Uh, so, okay, so for our push bit map call, the Z bias in this case is going to be proportional to the height, right? Um, so I'm just going to say for now, it's going to be some value proportional to the height. We don't know what that value is going to be yet, um, but, you know, we'll have to tune that based on how much uh, we want our sprites to sort of be upstanding. That's what we need. Uh, and that's all we need. Uh, that's the complete modification that would have to happen in order for our sprites uh, to properly now be set up for the shader to actually work with them. Again, unfortunately, we don't have a shader yet, uh, so that's the next part that we would have to tackle. Now, in order to tackle that, we're going to have to load a bunch of stuff in here and do uh, a bunch of ridiculous shenanigans, uh, because the shader stuff... With GPUs, you just have to appreciate the fact that they were sort of designed by committee and designed over a long period of time incrementally where no one really knew what they were going to be doing at the end. The shader stuff is incredibly, incredibly ugly. Uh, it doesn't matter what GPU um, API you use. You can use DirectX 11 or 12 or Vulkan or Metal or OpenGL or any of the other alphabet soup of ways of talking with them. Shaders are always just this really, really broken half abstraction uh, of stuff. And it's, it's just ugly. So you just kind of have to grit and um, grit your teeth and, uh, and power through. Uh, there's nothing I can say other than it's it's a mess. It's why I didn't really want to do them on Handmade Hero, but because we decided to kind of go a little f uh, further down the 3D path and actually get Z-buffering in the game, I'm afraid that I have to show you how to do this. Uh, and so here we go. Um, so I won't talk about the, the shader stuff in particular today or how it works because that will be saved for next weekend. So again, all I'm doing is trying to do some groundwork here so that we won't have as much busy work to do uh, next weekend. So basically all I want to do is get our OpenGL uh, platform layer to the point where it can execute shader code rather than executing the fixed function pipeline. That's all we want to do. So in order to do this, uh, we need to start thinking in terms of programs. Uh, and here on uh, docs.gl, wherever that was, uh, let's see here. Uh, here on docs.gl, uh, we need to start learning about things like bind program uh, and, uh, uh, let's see, compile shader, these sorts of things. All right, so, uh, and link and all that other good stuff. Um, so let's do get these up here. Uh, we are going to need GL uniform. And I'm not sure what else we're going to need. I have to remember as we go. Uh, but I guess is it text? There's one more Jill. Um, shader source. That's what I'm looking for. All right. OK. So uh, let's start by talking about how OpenGL does this stuff. Uh, and again, I'm going to skip the shader part because that's a good thing to kind of cover as a unit. So we'll cover how to actually write one next weekend. I'm just trying to get the OpenGL code in place to actually load them, right? So the first thing that we need to be able to do if we're going to create shaders in OpenGL is we need to be able to specify the shader code to OpenGL. Now, OpenGL, unlike um, its uh, sort of some of the other, like, like DirectX, for example, it doesn't deal in terms of an assembly language for shaders. Instead, it deals in terms of actual just straight source code. Now, it doesn't have to deal with source code because you can also do things like 
ask it to compile a program down to binary and save the binary, which you can then refeed it later. But you always have to be able to fall back to source because compiling a binary, uh, the, the binary code will be specific to the GPU you compile it on. So on a particular machine, if, you know, if shader compilation, if you want to get that out of your pipeline, because maybe you have thousands of shaders and you want them all pre-compiled or who knows what, on any particular install, on a particular GPU, you can ask OpenGL to take shader source code, compile it to binary, and then use the binary from now on. You can do that if the GPU and driver don't change. But you always have to be able to fall back to the shader source code, because if you can't fall back to shader source code, anytime there's a new GPU or a new driver update that might need uh, to recompile, uh, it needs the source code again. So the fundamental, the primary uh, way that shaders are shipped in OpenGL is as source, not as an intermediate language. In DirectX, that's not the case. Uh, typically, shaders are compiled down to a sort of assembly language-like thing. It's not actually the assembly language for the card. It's an intermediate assembly language. And then that intermediate assembly language does get compiled by the card into binary later. Then there's also a thing called SPIRV, uh, which is, um, did I say that right? Shader program intermediate representation V, yeah. I don't know what the V stands for. <laughs> um, five, I don't know. Uh, so there is another thing called SPRV that Vulkan uses, which is sort of the OpenGL version of an intermediate representation that's more like an assembly language. That is, um, uh, an assembly language might be the wrong term there, but it's, you know, it's an intermediate rep, not the source code. That uh, is also, I believe, getting back ported to OpenGL now so that you can use it in OpenGL as well as Vulkan as an intermediate language. So there's a whole mess of that sort of stuff happening. But as far as we're concerned, because we don't have to worry too much about most of that, since we are only going to have a very small number of shaders, it's not really an issue. For us, we are always going to be dealing with just text that is the actual C-like code that shaders use to describe what they want to do in source. So the first thing we need to be able to do is take that source and turn it into um, some actual usable shader in open, that OpenGL can use. And GL shader source is the uh, call that does that. So if I want to do that in OpenGL, I need, and I'm just going to start by making a little scratch space here where we can put this stuff in. Um, maybe I'll put it up here in, uh, in the top. Uh, we got oh, get info, get screen space. Set screen space. Why is that still here? Nobody knows. All right, <laughs> that's always good. Um, GL bind frame buffer. All right. Anyway, uh, so what we need to do here is we need to have something that's actually going to compile these shaders, right? Uh, and so what I need to do is I need to have something that's going to call uh, GL shader source, like you can see here. Uh, and it's going to have to pass some things. One is the shader, right? And it's the handle of the shader object which, uh, whose source code is, is to be replaced. And so much like textures, there's this, this notion of sort of handles. Uh, and you can see here that I'm going to need to make one of those uh, in order to do this. So you, there's a corresponding call GL create shader. Um, and you can see there's the GL uint there, uh, which is the uh, shader index. I'm going to call this uh, vertex shader. We'll call that ID. Uh, when we create a shader, we say what type we want. Uh, in this case, I want a GL vertex shader. Uh, I'm going to specify uh, this shader source code here. Uh, and what you can see, uh, there's kind of a, an odd way that this is specified, but you'll understand in a second why. Uh, so the GL shader source. What it does is it says, OK, here is a not a string that says the source code, but a series of strings. So there's actually an array of strings uh, with a length of each one. And that says uh, for each, um, that, that says for each of those strings, take the strings and concatenate all these together and process them like one big source file, right? And what's that for? Well, it's basically for include. Right? It basically, it's a cheap way to do includes without you having to do it yourself. So in here, I can say, 
OK, uh, we've got shader source code. Uh, maybe I want two things. And so what I want here is my um, vertex shader array. Uh, and maybe I could do this, you know, array count uh, vertex shader code. Um, vertex shader code uh, and vertex shader code length. So here is an example of how this would be called. Uh, and then we just need something to, to fill it. And so you can see we got a GL care, um, which is vertex shader code. Uh, and I have to provide pointers here, right? Uh, and then I've got uh, a GL int, which is vertex shader code length. Uh, and then here, what I want to do is take uh, these guys, right, and do a string length on them. I need to know how long they are. Okay? At least I th assume so. I don't know if you can pass z zero here. Uh, you might be able to. Each element of the length array may contain the length of the corresponding string, the null character is not coming from, or a value less than zero to indicate that the string is null terminated. Um, so we could just specify negative ones here as well. looks like. Uh, and so in that case, too, we could just do this. This is going to be the same everywhere. And we could just pad this out. So even if we did more source code or something, right, uh, we'd be fine. OK. So now we have a way of creating a shader source code, feeding it down for the vertex shader. Uh, and I want to create two shaders. I want a vertex shader and I want a fragment shader. Those correspond to how we transform vertices and how we shade pixels, how we like compute the color of pixels. And like I said, I'll explain all this uh, next week in terms of when we actually want to write some shaders. Uh, so for the moment, we won't have to uh, worry too much about that. Um, but off we go here uh, with our fragment shader code and our vertex shader code, right? So now what I want to do is I want to make this function, right? What I want to do is I want to have a way to create programs uh, that OpenGL is going to use to uh, do our graphics pipeline processing. And we need to be able to specify how to deal with vertices. That's the vertex shader part. And how to deal with pixels. That's the fragment shader part. Uh, and so here, I'm just going to say, like, you know, OpenGL uh, create program. I'm going to say that whoever wants to create one of these programs, it'll probably return something in a second here, like, a, like uh, one of these IDs. So it's probably going to return, you know, GLUint or whatever. When it creates a program, I want to be able to pass a couple things. First of all, I want one care star uh, that is going to be uh, my vertex shader code. Um, I want my fragment shader, right? Uh, and then I also want a, a shared header, let's say. Like that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the header code in here, uh, the vertex code, the header code, and the fragment code, right? And so you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just using the fact that we can pass multiple strings to allow whoever is creating the program to pass some shared code that will be used by both. Uh, and then the code that's specific to the vertex shader and the code that's specific to the fragment shader. right? And again, that's just using the fact that OpenGL is nice and allows us to pass an array of strings to prevent me from having to concatenate these things together. right? So I'm just kind of using that feature. That's really all I'm doing. So when I've d once I've done this uh, and I've done my shader source, I now have shader IDs that have whatever code we passed in here compiled and ready to go. Uh, well, not really compiled, parsed and ready to go. Uh, and so now the question is, how do I actually bring them together into a shader? Uh, well, the answer is I do a GL um, compile shader on the actual uh, individual shader portions. And then I have to link them together as a program uh, in order to sort of bind the vertex and fragment shaders together. 
Uh, so I have to call GL compile shader. This again does nothing other than tell it, OK, now you can kind of finalize this code that I sent down. Um, so we'll go fragment shader ID. Vertex shader ID. Right? Uh, and then what we need to do is do that GL link program. But as you can see, there's some steps missing here. We don't have a program, and we haven't told it how to associate these with the program, right? So now we need to go to a few of the other uh, parts in here. First of all, we need to do create program. As you can see, that's exactly the same uh, as the, uh, it's exactly analogous to creating a shader. So here's GL create program. And again, we don't need any parameters because a program is the whole pipeline. It's when shaders come together to make a full pipeline. So we don't need to tell it anything. It's, it's just a program. Uh, and it has whatever it, it will have. And then what we need to do is use this function called GL attach shader to say what the shaders are that, that constitute this pipeline. So we say GL attach shader. Uh, we give it the program and the shader. So there's the program ID. There's the fragment shader ID, program ID, vertex shader ID. OK? So you can now see the full sort of sweep of creating a program that OpenGL is going to use. We assume, like we're going to learn next weekend, like I said, how this code actually works. Uh, so we're just assuming that in here is some valid code. We have some shared code that everyone's going to want to look at. We have some vertex code that's going to be only for the vertex uh, transform part of things. Some fragment code that's only for the pixel part. What we do is we create some just a, a buffer of negative ones because we're not going to specify any lengths explicitly. We're just going to use null termination. So that's just, a, a, uh, just there for that. We're going to create a vertex shader. So OpenGL understands there is a vertex shader that we want to talk about. We're going to pass down that code, the header code, the vertex code, say, here's the source code for it. We're going to compile it. And maybe we should compile it like this. Right? We're going to compile it. We're going to create a fragment one, same thing, compile that. And then we're going to go ahead and make a program which binds those two shaders together and link that program. That is all we really need to do uh, to create a, a functioning program in OpenGL. Then we can just spend all day filling in strings here that do different things, right? Just write arbitrary code that can be executed on the GPU. So we need all of that stuff. So we're going to have to go grab all of those functions and get them, right? Because these are all uh, functions that need to be bound uh, via wiggle get proc address, uh, just like everything else. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's go ahead up here. Uh, and we have to go to core arb and get all of our stuff. Uh, so we need GL create shader. Why are there six entries for this? Oh, because it creates chirp, right? Okay. Uh, so we need all these. We need create program. Uh, we need compile shader, attach shader. I guess we need all of these, actually. All right, so we've got Type desk now. Uh, and so here you can see, I don't know that we actually need bind attribute location yet, so I'm not going to put anything that we haven't actually called. We are going to need some stuff for binding attributes. Uh, we'll see what that's like later. Uh, but you can see here we've got attach, compile, create, uh, and uh, those are the, all the ones we needed from here. But we, we need um, link. Right? Uh, and we need shader source. Uh, 
Now, I can't tell which one, get shader source. There we go. We don't want get shader source. And uh, we're going to need link and use, obviously, as well. So let's go ahead and get those. There we go. OK. So I think we are now uh, pretty good to go in terms of uh, the basic stuff we need to get our compiling working. Uh, there is one more thing we're going to need, I think, in a second here, uh, but we'll see. All right. Oh. It's not what I meant to do at all. There we go. Sorry, I zoned out there for a second. Too much mindless text manipulation. Yeah. So <clears throat> looking at that, uh, you can see that we're starting to get a lot of things here that we have to query. And so, you know, obviously in my own code, I have some automated stuff that kind of generates these sorts of binding things for me. Uh, and so it's kind of a pain in the butt when you're doing it manually. Um, you can also use, there are like, libraries like glue or whatever that will do the querying for you if you want to. Um, but as you get into sort of trying to use extended open gel, because it's a little bit balkanized at this point, uh, you kind of have to deal with uh, either using a library or doing this stuff uh, yourself, unfortunately. Um, that's just how that goes. Okay. Uh, Actually, that was not what I wanted. Now I think about it. Uh, I actually want to retain this piece of information. Uh, because, yeah, this is just kind of mindless, and there's really no point to it, if that makes sense. You can easily automate it, something that just parses those header files and generates one of these things. There we go. Uh, but writing something like that on Handmade Hero is not particularly good use of time because by the time we finished it, we could have done them by hand, probably in shorter, right? So depends whether you're trying to solve the problem long term or whether you only need a little bit. So uh, here is. the appropriate wiggle get proc address stuff to get us all of the functions that we need to compile a program. And fortunately, there's not that many more functions we actually need because once we can compile programs, most of the, the new stuff that you need for shaders comes in the shader, which is just text you're passing to OpenGL and doesn't require any get proc address or anything like that because you're just sticking the code in the shader and off it goes. Uh, so that's pretty good, right? Um, what we do need to do, however, uh, what is the problem? Int assumed def does not what do missing types specifier int assumed. Where is the missing type specifier? Do you not know GL size i? Perhaps. Let me find out. I don't know if it knows GL size i or not. Let me just find out if that's the problem. So what don't you know? Do you know GL care? You know GL int. 
How do you not know GL shader source? What is the problem here? I'm not sure what it's actually complaining about. It would be really nice uh, if this gave me a column for the error so I knew what it was actually complaining about, uh, to say the least. Missing comma before star. Of course, there isn't. Let me get rid of these const here so I can see what it's actually talking about. So you have gl int, gl care, gl size i, and gl uint, all of which I feel like should be valid. GL care. So it doesn't know GL care? That I would not have expected, but I guess it doesn't. Well, that's pretty easy to rectify. All right. You learn something new every day. Uh, OK, so let's take a look here at GL um, stuff that we need here. Create shader is apparently uh, not found. Why not? Create shader. Oh, because I called it create shader. <laughs> Crate shader sounds good because games always have crates in them. So I feel like you do need a crate shader, right? Uh, that seems reasonable. All right, so we've got everything. We just need uh, the, oops. We just need the uh, pound defines for what a vertex and a fragment shader are. And then we're done. Uh, that's, that's all we should need. So let's see, put those in there. Uh, so now we can compile code. And uh, of course, that's not going to change anything. We still have our, our crazy uh, W coordinate being wrong there. Uh, so now we just need to go into the OpenGL code uh, and actually give it some code to compile, right? If I wanted to create a program, I could now. Um, that would be pretty easy to do. So let's create some of these uh, you know, while we're at it. Uh, here's our OpenGL info here. I'm not sure how we were setting up uh, like our OpenGL default texture stuff. I'm on default internal. Here you go. Um, so the way that we're doing this OpenGL default internal texture format thing, it, it sort of suggests to me that we maybe need to uh, have a sort of globals for OpenGL so that they're a little bit more uh, contained. Because uh, OpenGL default text internal format here and reserved uh, blit texture those things, I feel like now it's kind of at the point where we, we want this stuff to be sort of bundled together, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like this stuff should just kind of come into uh, like, you know, an OpenGL.h, basically. Uh, I, do, are we even including an OpenGL.h? I guess we don't yet. Um, <clears throat> uh, but some kind of an OpenGL.h here. go see where I want to make that. Uh, and what I'll do here is just say, uh, OK, here's an OpenGL.h. Uh, and this thing will have an OpenGL globals uh, piece of information, or I guess OpenGL, we could just call it OpenGL. It's just the stuff we need for OpenGL, right? Uh, and in here, I can stuff uh, these guys. Uh, 
And then I'll just say global variable OpenGL, OpenGL. Something like that. I don't know. Should it be open underscore GL? I don't really know. Maybe. Uh, and so I think that'll give me everything that I want here. Uh, and then every time we were using something like that, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, it this way. So you can kind of just see that those are bundled together and I don't have them strewn all over the place. Uh, not sure what's global and what's not or anything like that, right? So now that we've got that taken care of, uh, all I really need to do is go into the OpenGL init call and try creating some shaders and we can sort of start to work with that uh, and get ourselves in position to do it uh, next, next week. Here we go. Uh, so this OpenGL init should really be down kind of at the bottom. We can start to move things into that uh, global as well, which will be nice. Uh, so here's our OpenGL init. Um, and we can pretend at the end of this here, for example, that maybe we want to create some programs. Uh, and maybe we say that OpenGL, uh, we've got you know two programs, uh, or I guess we probably just have <clears throat> um, in this case, for all of our rendering, we probably would have the default, I mean, I guess we'll, maybe we'll just call it for now, our ZBIAS program. Uh, maybe basic ZBIAS. Uh, and when we call open GL create program, uh, what we need is the header code, the vertex code, and the fragment code, right? Uh, and in this case, we can sort of just be kind of absurd here if we want to. Uh, the header code, oops, <clears throat> unfortunately, C++ only recently supported here docs. It would be really nice if they did, but since they don't, you kind of have to do it this way until uh, you get to a version of a compiler that actually supports here docs, which only the latest ones do. Um, but for now, we can sort of say, here's header code, right? And uh, we can do vertex code and fragment code uh, similarly, right? So basically, this is a way to do header code, vertex code, fragment code, uh, and actually have it all, as far as I know, work properly. We can sort of go in and take a look at that now. So now we have the ability to create a program. We know how to pass the text down to it, right? And so if I come down through here, um, hmm. ah, so when we do our init, we haven't yet finished all of this stuff. I guess I misunderstood what we were doing in our init there. So our init, I'm not sure why is our init happening before we query? That seems really strange. Uh, I think that's because of the way that OpenGL get info used to be happening. 
Uh, but I think that's not probably how we want it. I would think what we probably want is open jail get info, modern context. Uh, and then probably what we want to do is do this stuff here uh, and then come down and do this, uh, right? And the reserved blit texture stuff should probably happen here and, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, if we're, looking, if we're looking at what's sort of going on here. So I feel like we probably want something more like that. Um, and then, you know, the open jail info would be getting passed down here. Like so. Now in the OpenGL info, where is that struct? Does that appear? Yeah. The OpenGL info structure, I'm going to grab out, put it up here. You can see that that already has the modern context piece of information in it, uh, which means that it wouldn't have to, to pass it here. And the frame buffer supports sRGB part of it as well, uh, is also something that it would presumably know. Um, Not sure exactly how that one should work. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, and we should be good to go. All right. So I think now those would be initialized when we get to them and we should be in good shape. Uh, you can see here that uh, we've gotten through that compilation phase okay. Um, and so now what we need to do, uh, we still got a little bit of time, we still got about 15 minutes left. Uh, so if we take a look at what we need to do now, uh, we're, we're just at the point where um, we've, we can call, we can pass code down here, whatever we want. Um, but if there was a problem, like when we call open jail create program, one of the things that we're going to find is we don't actually know whether the compilation succeeds or fails yet, right? We haven't checked any errors in here. And furthermore, if something did fail, we're going to need to know what failed, right? We're going to need to get, have to get some kind of uh, information back from open jail that'll tell us uh, how to debug, you know, like what's going on. We're passing it source code. We could have a typo in the source code. We could, you know, be calling something wrong uh, and the compiler might fail. We need to get errors back so that we're in a position to debug the shaders uh, as well. And so uh, it, there is ways we can get that information as well. Um, and I believe it's the program info log and the shader info log calls are the two places that that happens. If I remember properly. Um, so let's take a look at those. You can see here what happens is it returns uh, basically a text buffer. You give it a, a, a sort of a chunk of memory and then it will fill out that chunk of memory uh, with a um, with a, a um, textual description of what went wrong in the compilation if something went wrong in the compilation. Uh, now, I don't actually know, um, I can't remember, I might have to look up. I don't quite remember what the best way is to, okay, here it is. I, was like there, I knew there was a way to validate the program to make sure that it works, uh, and here we go. So, uh, GL validate program, uh, so from after we call GL validate program, we can call get program with arguments program and GL validate status, and that will tell us whether or not the validation occurred. So what we want to do here is we want to call that, right? We want to call v GL validate program, uh, and it takes that program handle, and then we want to call GL get program. Uh, here's that. Uh, we just now need to say uh, we want to know what the validate status is of the program. Uh, and that's the program then that the params is uh, just the requested object. So we just need a geolint. We'll assume it's false. On startup, there's our program ID. 
So this will tell us whether or not the program validated. And so what we want to know now is if it didn't validate, right? then we can call these other functions. right? Uh, not that one. Oops. Program info log. Uh, so the only thing that I'm not sure I remember is for the shaders, I don't know if you can validate a shader. Uh, I don't know how you know whether or not the shaders validated individually. Probably there is no point because shaders, you wouldn't really know if they're valid. I mean, you might know if they're obviously invalid, but you don't really know if they're fully valid until they all come together anyway. Uh, so I suspect what we want to do um, is call get program info log in the case where the program uh, got messed up. But we probably also need to uh, get the shader info log. Uh, and we probably need to do that uh, in the cases, yeah, in the case where we're not validated because I don't know that where it will necessarily report the errors, right? Um, so what we want to do here is we want to create some way that we can sort of uh, get this information out. Uh, so we'll just say shader uh, validation failed. Um, and then we'll just say, all right, we've got a uh, vertex error. Uh, and then we'll just go ahead and get the logs for everything. So for the shader info logs, we need to pass our vertex shader ID and our fragment shader ID. Uh, and we're not going to uh, bother with the length. Uh, so there's that GL size I. And we're going to ignore that. So uh, for the program itself, where's my program info log? There it is. Exact same. Uh, and so now in theory, we should be able to, to uh, get, oops, I did my internal caps on size of there. So now we should be able to, any time OpenGL says that there was a failure in validating the program that we passed it, we should be able to get some error buffers back uh, that'll tell us what happened, right? Uh, and so again, this is just an uh, uh, exercise in busy work now to just cut and paste those from the core ARB. Get program info log. go shader info log validate program and I think that's all the new things we we're calling right get program Uh, so now that I think about it, we which one do we want here? Get program IV for validate status. I assume it's yes. So we want get program an inter vector of integers. Uh, so give me that one, and I think we've got them all. There we go. Text busy work. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so that's all of the new ones here, just four new functions. Those will get stuck at the bottom here. There we go. And now we'll actually query them. So, we've got you'll get program info log. Shader info log. Validate program. And get program for. So I think that should be all the functions we had. Validate status, we will have to copy. Um, not sure that needs to be there. Uh, I meant to call that ignored. And that is the wrong spelling for that. So I think we're all good. And then all I need is the GL validate status. Uh, and I assume that will be sufficient. Okay. Uh, so a lot of busy work there, um, but uh, in theory, everything is now okay. Um, so let's take a look. Vertex errors, fragment errors, program errors. So here's our compilation. You can see that the vertex shader was successfully compiled to run on hardware. Fragment shader was successfully compiled to run on hardware. And then here's our program errors. Vertex shaders failed to link. Fragment shaders failed to link. Not all shaders have valid object code. So not particularly useful information in this case. Of course, we didn't actually feed it real code, right? It's just some comments. So everything compiled OK, but none of them have actual content. So when it goes to link, it's like, hey, I don't know what I should actually do here, right? Um, but other than that, uh, it's all a reasonable shape, right? Um, so we only have a couple other things that we need to start talking about. Um, uh, but otherwise, we're pretty much good to go. Uh, we will have to use a GL use program call, and then we'll have to be able to bind attributes to those uh, as well. So we have a little bit of work that we will have to do in uh, in, a, in a moment. But otherwise, we're we're pretty much done. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and go to the Q and A. And next week, uh, we can talk about um, shaders uh, and what they do so we can actually write some shader code and then we'll be able to uh, finish that up and actually start calling through the shader. Cam died. Really? 
Oh, wow. Um, I've never seen that happen before. Oh, the camera did not die. It looks like o o OBS, OBS's ability to composite the camera died. Oh no, it was just, it was set on the wrong, looks like it was set on monitor instead of programming for some reason. All right, so nothing, nothing was actually wrong there, just somehow that got set to monitor. So I asked the kid, for some of the OpenGL function type tests, you have the Win API entry point and others don't. I thought it was necessary to have it or else you get runtime errors when calling those functions, or at least I did. Um, so actually, you never really need it uh, in 64-bit code. Um, where are those guys? Those guys are over here. Uh, I should probably keep it in there just to be nice, um, but it's, it's really not necessary. Uh, in 32-bit code because 32-bit code only has one calling convention. So if you remember back on Handmade Hero when we talked about calling conventions, uh, essentially if you're linking to a DLL uh, in 32-bit code, you need to make sure you specify the, the calling convention. Um, we don't actually have to do that in 64-bit code, but if we ever wanted to compile 32-bit code, we would have to. Uh, it's really not necessary otherwise, I guess is how I would say it. So if you had problems with it, probably the reason you did was because you were probably compiling 32-bit code, would be my guess. The Sizic, instead of Z-bias, why not make the sprite card stand up at a steeper angle and make them trapezoidal to undo the protective foreshortening? Uh, so if you remember correctly, I did the math for that on a previous stream, and that is what I was going to do. But then I realized, why would we spend the time doing the math for that when we could just change the Z value in a vertex shader? Basically, we would be spending way more math time, we would be doing way more operations per sprite than we needed to do for no reason. Because all the only reason we'd be solving for the correct trapezoid um, in that case is to change the Z value. So it seemed like a really bad use of, of compute power there. Uh, and so I decided to just go ahead and have shaders uh, that just you feed a, a different Z value because that's all we really need. And then there's no extra computation being done. So it's much more efficient. Uh, Bimbinel, uh, when you started writing the place, placeholder shader code, you mentioned something about C++ something docs that are not yet fully implemented. What is this feature exactly? Um, so uh, I, I, I honestly don't know who coined this term. It, it's weird, uh, and uh, I apologize. Uh, it's just it's the term uh, that's used. And uh, I, yeah, I, I got nothing. I do not know why it's called this. I guess it's because, hey, the document is here. I don't know. Um, but anyway, a here document uh, is what they call it, a here doc, uh, is when you've got source code for some language and then you want to stick a bunch of source code for another language or something that is not in that language in between, right? And so what it is, is it's a way of saying, hey, I'm going to start a bunch of text here. This text is not supposed to be parsed by you. Uh, so don't do your standard parsing on it. Just Read it all and accept it as some data that you're going to use later. Uh, and so C++ sort of has a little bit of, of a here doc in a way originally, right? Um, let me grab where we're doing that. So C++ sort of has a little bit of a concept of a here doc, which is a string, right? Um, an ASCII Z string is sort of like it. Um, but it's not really a complete here doc, and the reason is because uh, all sorts of parsing still happens in here, right? That happens, parsing for that happens, quote happens, I can't have a new line, right? Um, and so the degree to which a language supports here docs is sort of more about the degree to which you can embed other document structure, other co uh, sort of data in there, that, and to what extent you can turn the parser off. So in the future, C++ uh, may be able to 
uh, properly support Herodox because it's in the spec and like LLVM supports it. I think maybe Visual Studio supports it in 20, the, uh, I don't know if it supports it in 2015. But at some point, all the C compilers you care about will be supporting this because it's in the spec now. But at the moment, like I think I'm on 2013, I believe, um, it, for this stream, uh, we use the community edition of 2013. That's what we started with and that everyone had. Um, it, it, I don't believe, has it, so we can't use it. Do you think the Google's Angle library that translates OpenGL to DirectX calls would solve the sRGB problem on your graphics card? Uh, it might. I, I do not know. Uh, it might be, it, would, it depends on whether this card properly supports sRGB rendering to MSAA in DirectX. I don't, it might be that this, for whatever reason, the driver just kind of busted and won't work. I don't know. Uh, why are you downsizing 8 pixels into 1 using a blit and not using 32-bit math and rendering 6 back into 2 with a subtract to finalize 8? 2 pass out of 8-bit back to render allows alpha on-off values and color value attach AC instead of color value where alpha belongs in blit. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Um, we're not downsizing eight pixels. We're just we're using multi-sample, uh, which is to say that the the there's eight samples per pixel taken uh, to allow us to do um, order independent uh, alpha edges. If that makes sense. Insofar as it says you can pass null as the length ram to GL shader source and it treats all the strings as null terminated. I was hoping that would be the case, but it didn't say that in the docs. If that's the case, uh, then we can get rid of this, which would be nice. Uh, because there's no point to it. I just didn't see anything in the, le in the docs that said that that would be okay. Uh, so I assumed it wasn't okay. Oh, uh, whoops. That should really be down here. All right. Let's just double check that that works. Frosty Ninja, can't we just adjust? Can't we just adjust gamma in the shaders? Uh, we could, but it's typically faster not to do that because the hardware has built-in lookup tables for it usually, or at least that was my understanding. Um, in various places, now that may not be true anymore. I don't know, uh, and we could, but in general, we should be allowing the graphics card to use whatever its fastest method is, rather than microcoding it essentially for it in the shader. 
Um, so I'd like to find out why it's not working, because every other card that I know of or situation I know of, it would work. Frosty says, regarding checking shader status, I believe the best practice is checking geo compile status after compiling a shader and then geo link status after linking a program. Uh, that might be true, although I guess I don't know what the difference in a lot of these would necessarily be. Um, I'm not sure what the pros and cons of any particular one is. I'm not sure why there are so many ways that it happens, to be completely honest, but. Are you eventually going to move shader code into the asset packs or are you going to keep it in line? Uh, probably always in line because we want it to be something that modifies with the code, not with the asset packs. Uh, the asset packs are for assets, obviously, and they get updated very infrequently, whereas shaders we want to have a fast turnaround time on. The size of, won't there still be problems if a tree is in front of a tall block if the sprite still technically intersects the tile above? Um, there might be. Uh, but even if there were, so I would rather handle that in the vertex shader on the GPU rather than handling it on the CPU side, right? Um, because again, I can do stuff in there that I couldn't do otherwise. However, I don't know that there's anything you could really do. Uh, I mean, essentially it doesn't matter, right? Like, no matter what you do with those sprite cards, there's no point, if, if they have to show up as a card, then there's no difference between multiply, changing the Z bias and creating a trapezoid. They're both exactly the same, right? Because the only difference is what the screen space Z value is. So it's always better to do it, I think, the Z bias way. There's never a case where doing a trapezoid would give you anything other than less computation, I mean, sorry, more computation resources being spent to do it. A slams here. Will you implement shader hot loading? Um, I think we could probably. I think if we just move. I think if we basically just move the thing that gets the shaders. Uh, if we move that into uh, our reloadable code section, which we could pretty easily do, uh, then I think we would just have it for free. Right. Right now, it wouldn't work because the program only gets compiled at init time. So we have to have a thing that tells it to recompile the program. Um, but that's about all we would need because we already have the hot code reloading. So in theory, it would work. Looks like no more Q colons. Hot loading seems safest with use of bind attribute location, correct? So as not to have to chase locations all over the place. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I guess that's a good point. I mean, I guess, so probably what we should do is move the OpenGL code into the reloadable section. Um, that's probably what we should be doing. Zane says, last time I was here, you talked about the int32x types. What are your thoughts on type space versus cache utilization? Um, usually, that's just a, an as, you know, as the cases present themselves kind of a situation. So basically, like, I tend not to think too hard about optimization issues um, until I actually have something to optimize, right? Uh, so I don't tend to think about how big a type is uh, unless I fear that it is a cache going to be a cache problem. Like it's I, unless I'm thinking it's in a place where I think it's really likely that cache effects are going to be a problem. I'm like planning for that, um, or uh, where I think that uh, you know there's some other reason for the type's size to be relevant, like loading off of disk or marshaling over the network, that sort of thing. But in general, I don't tend to think about the size of types in terms of their impact on the cache unless I actually am thinking about optimizing something at that point. Because otherwise, I feel like it's just wasted thought, really. Uh, because if you haven't actually measured what you're doing and you haven't actually decided you're optimizing it, then you're really just guessing and fussing around, you know? Uh, and it seems like kind of unproductive to do that until you actually know what you're doing. Ratchet Freak, if you recreate the program when hot reloading, you should probably free the old shaders and program. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to do so. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you cared about this being something that an end user was going to have to do, you would, uh, because in that case, you could, you know, if they kept reloading and reloading and reloading and reloading, they might run out of handles or something. Uh, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. We can just leave those old programs around right they don't they don't harm us by being by just sitting around Are the programs cleared automatically when the game exits? Uh, yeah. All of your GPU resources that you've acquired, if you crash or if you exit uh, cleanly or any other thing that happens, everything is, is purged. All your textures, all your programs, everything. Um, unless there's a bug in the driver or in Windows, uh, they are all going to go away. Um, let's see. Do you have any opinions about temporal amplitude? Not really. Uh, it's not something I've really worked with, so I don't have much to say about it. Uh, and then last question. I assume that you don't give much thought to how hot data is. I remember a talk by Andre that you could get a few percent speed up just from organizing the data according to hotness. Um, yeah, again, like I said, I feel like when you're creating architectures and working on getting code to the point where it does what you want it to do, 
typically I'm not thinking about any optimization issues at all, except for making sure that I'm not doing something I believe will make it fundamentally impossible or very difficult for me to optimize uh, sections of the code later. So if I, to the extent that I ever think about stuff like how cache, things are cache aligned or how uh, things are organized due to how hot they will be uh, to, you know, on average, I'm only going to think about those things in passing when doing the main work on the code. And then only when I'm starting to optimize a particular section because I believe it to be performance critical, am I going to actually try to measure and organize and optimize for any of those things. You really shouldn't be thinking about those all the time because you probably can't get it right without actually being actually working on it, right? Um, like most of the time on modern hardware, optimization is very tricky and oftentimes counterintuitive. It's not like the old days where it was very straightforward and easy to understand. So if you think that you can make improvements to your program's performance by randomly doing stuff as you're writing code when you're not even testing it for optimization or looking at performance counters or you're not in the actual situation uh, that it will actually be in production and so on and so forth, Typically, you're probably not really doing anything all that great. Like probably mostly what you're doing there are going to be things that are, you know, could be as likely to hurt as help because you just don't know. You, you, you're, not really, you're not really measuring the results and you're not really knowing that what you're doing is correcting a problem or improving a situation, right? Habarishu. Unless there's a bug in the driver in Windows. Yeah, there are never any bugs in those. Uh, yeah, that's why I said that, obviously. Um, so uh, that's why I said that when I said, you know, unless there's a bug or driver in, or in Windows, everything gets purged. Uh, chances are sometimes there might be bugs in Windows or uh, Win32, which would result in things, uh, Windows or the driver, which result in things not getting purged properly. Uh, but again, that's not a reason to delete the shader code um, because there's just as likely to be a bug in that right? Um, meaning, you know, if, if there's bugs in the driver in terms of purging stuff out, then there just could be bugs. And you have no idea where they are. And you're not working around them in any more likely fashion by freeing stuff or not, right? Um, for all you know, the bug might be in the free call, where is if you call the free call, it accidentally does something that makes it not get purged when the game exits, right? So, you know, bugs are bugs. There's nothing you can do that will make it like, you know, better in that case. Will you eventually be doing such a pass over handmade hero? Uh, probably not, because I don't think we're going to have performance cr concerns of that form. Um, if we do, uh, then we would, uh, but probably we won't. Should you add a a oh probably backslash n I think Twitch filtered out. Should you add a backslash at the end of each line with the format you are using? Wouldn't it be parsed by the OpenGL as a long comment as it is now? Uh, yes. Yeah, so what we're going to have to do? There's two reasons to do that. Um, just so what we're talking about here. Uh, so yes, as we add code to here, we will have to do this um, as we go. Uh, once there's more lines in here. Technically, you don't have to at anything that's not a comment. Like, so you could also just do this, right? Um, and it'll parse fine. But uh, the reason to add is not because of the comments, uh, the reason to add the backslash ends. The reason for the backslash ends is actually that the error reporting will be better. Um, because when it reports an error, it'll tell you the line it's on. It won't necessarily tell you the column it's on. So if all you have is a line number, you really want to insert line breaks all over the place so that you can tell where it's complaining, if that makes sense. Starchy pancakes. Hey, Casey, I got a job as a gameplay programmer. Wouldn't have happened without the stream, not in a million years. Dude, that's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Congratulations. I hope that it starts a really good career for you. If, if, if game programming is what you're into, I hope you enjoy it and uh, you continue to find it interesting. That's great. Well, that's a great one to end on. 
I'm very happy to hear that, starch pancakes. That's great. Um, make a good game. I don't know very much about gameplay programming myself. You'll probably know more about it than me pretty soon. I only ever do the engine code and, you know, I, I, I always would defer to John Blow on how you write gameplay code because I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, he's the expert on that stuff, because uh, I feel like I feel like if you write gameplay uh, code, you kind of have to be a bit of a designer, you know. Maybe um, I mean you'll know. I guess as you start doing it, you'll see. But um, I feel like uh, I feel like I'm not super qualified to write gameplay code because I just don't necessarily know the right stuff to do for the game design kind of pieces of it, you know? Um, and so if you're a gameplay programmer, if you're, if you're doing gameplay programming, you'll probably learn that stuff. Uh, you'll be ahead of me pretty soon because um, you'll probably learn a lot more about the design, uh, how the design works in there. And, uh, and that's kind of an interesting part. That's, that's really what makes gameplay code, you know, different from engine code is that gameplay code is very much about enabling design uh, whereas uh, game engine code is, is more about technical requirements that are easier to articulate, you know? Um, it's easier to say what you need in engine code, and it's m more difficult to say what you need in gameplay code because gameplay code is sort of fungible and has this design element where you're exploring things that don't really necessarily know how to verbalize potentially what's supposed to happen, but you know that it's supposed to happen, right? And so it's kind of a... It has a softer element to it that I feel like you kind of need experience. You need the you need to have done gameplay programming in a real game scenario uh, to really feel it. So that's going to be cool because you're going to get that experience and uh, and you'll probably learn a lot from that. I would expect uh, and probably learn a lot of things that I don't know. Um, so anyway, best of luck to you. All right, folks. Uh, with that, we wish Start Your Pancakes well. That's pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap the rest of the stream up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me for Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along uh, with the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. It comes with the source code. Um, and uh, if you want to play around with it, that's an easy way to do it. Uh, if you want to ask questions, we have a forum site. If you want to support our video series, we do have a Patreon page as well. We've got a schedule bot that tweets the schedule um, and uh, lets you know we're going to be live. And we have a past episode guide if you want to catch up with old episodes. That's it for this week. Uh, next week we'll be back when we'll write some shader code. Uh, hopefully that won't be too much um, of a yak shave because uh, all we really want to do is some very simple uh, stuff in there. But until then... Uh, have fun programming, and we will uh, see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.